So my dear, uh, dear brothers and sisters, uh, we just want to, as, we, as I said, you know, a simple teaching, a simple presentation of the Christmas story. The Christmas story begins from the very book of Genesis, the first book, the promise of a savior. So in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, this is what the word of God says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And here is it, isn't it? You know, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3, sisters and brothers, please read it before Christmas. Every Catholic must read these three chapters. It's so important. The entire story of salvation in a nutshell can be found in Genesis 1, 2 and 3. So here is chapter 3, the promise of a savior. We know how sin came. We know uh, uh, how the serpent tempted uh, Eve and Adam and sin entered the world. And now see what the Lord is saying. I will put enmity between you and the woman. The woman is Mary. The woman is Mary. Between your, and then he says, between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring is the Savior, is Jesus Christ. He, the offspring of the woman, Mary, he shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. Sisters and brothers, Jesus was sent as a savior of the world and to destroy the works of the evil one. And we know if you get an injury to our head, it can be fatal. And that's why the word of God says, he will bruise your head. But he will only bruise your heel. An injury to a heel will not kill you. But an injury to a head can kill you. And here is this promise, a savior who's going to save us and destroy the power of the evil one. And that's why we find in, in John, in 1 John chapter 3 verse 8, the reason that the son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And this is why Jesus came. This is also the good news. That's why we proclaim the good news. Christmas is all about light dispelling darkness, isn't it? Light dispelling darkness. This is why Jesus came to be a savior and to destroy the works of the devil. So you find this again, you know, this beautiful story in uh, Numbers, right? You see in Numbers 21 verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent Set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. What is the story? The story is that Moses is leading his people, right? In the wilderness, they got fed up. They got tired. At some point of time, they were started to grumble against Moses, grumble against God. They thought Egypt was any day better they didn't understand the hand of God in their life, leading them from captivity to freedom. And they started grumbling. And then what happened? Um, God told Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. There were snakes, right? What happened when they started grumbling, the serpent started biting them. You will find that in verse 7. And whoever the serpent bit died. You see uh, the impact of the evil one. But the Lord said to Moses, because they went and complained to Moses, Moses, save us, please save us. And then Moses, and this is what God told Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. Hallelujah. Christmas is all about life. Whatever may be the calamities, whatever may be the crisis, whatever the evil one is trying to destroy, to kill, yeah, and to, to, to kill and to destroy the Lord has come to bring life and to restore everything and so this uh, uh, Numbers 21 verse 8 is a prefiguration right Jesus is going to die for us on a pole and whoever looks to him will be saved whoever believes in him will be saved and he shall live Jesus came to give us eternal life that's why Christmas is so important he was born so that you and I can live and live 
joyfully and experience the abundant life of Jesus. And that's why Jesus, you know, in Luke 24 to 27, the story of Amos. Remember, he was walking with two other friends. And here it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was written in all the scriptures about himself. Jesus revealed to them that all that was written in the Old Testament concerning him is getting fulfilled. So Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. And that's the reason why Jesus is key. He's so important for us. The new, in, uh, new Testament, the new covenant, the New Testament is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. And that's why this is the promise, you know, that God promised us a savior from the very beginning. Yeah. Okay, so that's why, dear brothers and sisters, it is very important for us to also, and that's why the church also takes us during this time of Advent through many of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. Mm. Because we need to know that he is the promised one. Amen. And no one else is going to come. There's not going to be another Messiah. So many other religions, uh, they, they prophesy and they're, they're talking about a Messiah who will come. And even the people of Israel are still waiting for the Messiah. Okay? They need, mm -hmm. everyone needs to realize and understand that Jesus is the fulfillment Amen. of all these Old Testament prophecies. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to also walk in this conviction. So if anyone ever questions us, we should be able to point to Jesus mm -hmm. and say he is the fulfillment. That's why it is so important for us to study the word and be familiar with the scriptures. Old and new. Amen. Old and new testament. Amen. Okay. And that's why it is so important for us, right, sisters and brothers, you know, as we gather on these webinars and listen to the word of God, that the Messiah has come. The Messiah has come. The waiting period is over, right? It's over. Don't wait for another Messiah. Don't look for a, any other person to become your Messiah. Nobody is the Messiah. Only Jesus Christ. And that's why it is so important. Christmas is so important. We have a Messiah, Christ the Lord. Okay. So we're just going to go through another few prophecies of how Jesus and his birth was a total miracle from the beginning to the very end of his life. Jesus' life was a life that was totally miraculous. Okay. He was born of a virgin. Impossible. How can anyone be born of a virgin? Okay, see what Isaiah had already prophesied. It. Isaiah in chapter 7 verse 14 said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. So this was going to be a very important sign. And, and that's why Matthew in the gospel of Matthew highlights this and says, Hey, remember what Isaiah said. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Brothers and sisters, Jesus' birth was a miraculous one. His very conception was in the womb of a virgin. There was no man involved. There was no male seed involved. That is why the prophecy was given to, when, when God spoke to the serpent, he said, her seed. Okay, normally a woman doesn't have seed. It's the male who has the seed. But Jesus was born of a virgin. And she was his physical mother. Therefore, Jesus is known as the seed of Mary. And his birth was miraculous because his very conception was miraculous. And, and, uh, and Isaiah is talking to, uh, to, to the king Ahaz. And he's saying, you know, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Something that is impossible is going to happen to prove that God is going to come and make his dwelling among men and that's why his name will be called Emmanuel and Emmanuel is God with us amen so from the time of Jesus from the time Jesus came God became one with us God became one with us the division because of sin which divided us which broke you know which broke the connection and our relationship with God Jesus came for restoration and for that he came as a miraculous, the, the miraculous son of God born of a virgin. Okay. 
And in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 35, we have the story of the Annunciation. Okay, where we have, you know, we've been reading it Sunday and yesterday, you know, in the gospel, because it's it's so important. It is so important. That's why the church, you know, makes us look again and again. And there is so much we can learn in this amazing story, brothers and sisters. And it's all about how God does the impossible. Yeah. In Mary's life, through Mary, because of her yes to God. And this is what the angel Gabriel tells Mary. And he said, you will be overshadowed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and that is why the child who is going to be born is not going to be a normal, you know, normal human being. He's going to be the son of God. Because there is no, no human, human intervention in this. It is all about God. That's why Mary asked, she says, but I'm a virgin. How can I, how can I conceive? So then the angel explains, you know, and he says, this is not going to be a human act. It's going to be a divine act because the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And never has this ever happened before. And never will it happen again. And the power of God will overshadow you. This is like, you know, this is an image of how the, the cloud, the glory cloud overshadowed the tent, the temple and the ark, the ark. And in the same way, it overshadowed Mary, who is now the, the ark of the new covenant. Because God was going to be born in her, conceived within her. Therefore, the angel says, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Primarily, Jesus is first and foremost Son of God. His origin is divine. He is from God. That's why he's God from God, light from light, true God from true God. That's the God we're celebrating in his, in the virgin birth. Yeah. Uh, what I want to add here is, you know, God did something impossible for Mary. All she had to do was trust God. The Lord will do the same thing in our lives. He will do the impossible in our lives. Whatever we are going through in our lives, you know, uh, maybe finances, maybe marriage, children, business, uh, maybe our jobs, maybe our health, the Lord will do the impossible. How will it be? By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord will work out the impossible in your life, restoring everything back to you. Everything back to you. That's how our God is. That's how our God is. So therefore, during this time of Christmas, for us also to have this expectancy, like Mary had. Expectancy and God will work the miracle for each one of us too. And that is why in Matthew 1.23, it says, Behold, the virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us. Doesn't matter what happens around us. Doesn't matter what happens around us, what people are reporting, what people are saying about any, any situation in our life. Don't worry. God is with us. God never abandons his children. His chosen people, he will never abandon. All we need to do to experience his presence, the Emmanuel in our lives, is to stay close to him. It's to stay close to him in, with, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So our God, Jesus, in Matthew 121, she will give birth to a son, and you will you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So we can see here, we can see here that the Lord is not only Emmanuel, God with us, he's also here to save us. He's here to save us. He's a protector, he will save us. He will save us. He will save his people from what? From our sins. He will save us from our sin, our shortcomings, our weaknesses. God has come to save us. So this Christmas, the Lord wants to save us from any situation that we are facing. We think the future is bleak. The Lord will save us. This is the power of the Savior. Jesus means Savior. He comes to save us. He comes to save us. And in his saving act, he is with us. And this is the, the Christmas story. So who is Jesus, dear brothers and sisters? 
it's really, really important for us because it's a very personal question. Who is Jesus? Not just to the world, it's Jesus to you and me. And we need to be able to answer this question with a resounding, my Savior, my Lord. Amen. Okay? So that's what, that's what Isaiah also is telling us in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He says, for unto us, a child is born. This child, brothers and sisters, had no other reason to be born except for others, for us, for you and me. And unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Rule, power, authority are upon his shoulders. They, from this time on, after Jesus came, he was going to do all that was required to take back everything that human beings had lost because authority had been given to Adam and Eve. And when they sinned, the devil stole it. The devil usurped it. It was like a military coup. He took over the world. And that explains all the chaos, all the confusion in the world. But why did Jesus come? Jesus came to take back the government. He came to take back authority. All that human beings had lost. Jesus came to take back and restore. To restore to us. Okay. And the government will be from now on upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So brothers and sisters, the rest of this teaching, we're going to focus on these four beautiful names of Jesus and what it means to have this kind of a God as Emmanuel, the one who is with us. And as Romans says, you know, it says, uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? He's God who is with us. He's God who is for us. He's God because he is for us. No one can stand against us. Okay, and this is the kind of God we have who's a wonderful counselor. He's almighty God. He's everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. Jesus is God himself in the flesh, in the flesh, who became man for us. And he was born for us. As this word, as the scripture reminds us, unto us a son is given. Amen. He was given for us, to us. And as we have received him, brothers and sisters, let us also receive him as the wonderful counselor, as the mighty God, as the everlasting father and the prince of peace. And as the Isaiah is saying so beautifully, you know, unto us the son is given. So the son was given to us. Now it is for us to give the son to the world. Amen. Right? We know the world desperately needs Christ, desperately needs this Jesus. Where the government will rest on his shoulder, he'll be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. So, brothers and sisters, Christmas is a time to let's share the gift. Let's share the gift of Jesus to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends, to our colleagues, because we know that the world without Jesus is lost. It's lost. There is no other solution. The solution to the world's problem is the Messiah Jesus Christ. He is the answer to the world. He is the solution to the world. And so, this Christmas, let's not keep Christ only to ourselves. Let us also share Christ with our near and dear ones. So again, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, this is the angels are speaking to the shepherds and they say, today in the city of David, a savior has been born to you, to you. What a message, what, a, what good news, brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus is called, Jesus didn't just come to preach the good news. Jesus is the good news. Amen. He's good news personified. Until then, the whole world had, was lost, wandering, uh, miserable, with no hope. But on that day, on that day, a savior was born. 2,000 years ago, the angels announced this wonderful news to humble shepherds. The most unlikely, the most unlikely 
But God always looks out for the insignificant, the most unlikely, the humble, to, to reveal himself to them. So it's important for us, if you want to grow in revelation of God, if you want to grow in knowledge of him, we need to humble ourselves. We need to humble ourselves so that we can experience Christ as our savior in more and more ways. Because he came to save us from sin and all the consequences of sin, brothers and sisters. There is sickness, defeat, lack, poverty, uh, broken relationships. In all these, Jesus is our savior. And he has been born for you and for me. And he's not just savior. Today, he wants to be Lord. There's a big difference. There's a big difference between being savior and being Lord. Many people are happy to receive him as savior. But not everyone has surrendered to him as Lord. As Lord. So it's so important for us. That is a total, you know, giving up of ourselves. To say, Lord, you are first and you're the most important. I place you on the throne. So it's important for us, brothers and sisters, during this time, you know, to just uh, look, look into our own lives, to search our own hearts and see if Jesus is Lord of every area of our lives. Because today, he is standing at the door knocking. There are some closed doors. Maybe he's in our life, but not every door has been opened. So can we allow, allow him to enter those areas of our life, which we have probably closed all these years and invite him to be Lord even there. Brothers and sisters, we need to spend a little time on reflection, isn't it? As we move closer to Christmas Day, have we experienced the power of the Savior in our lives? I ask myself also this question. Have I fully experienced the power of the Savior in my life? Has, this, has the Savior Jesus saved you? Has, you, has he um, let you, you know, freed you from any bondage, any sin, besetting sin, a private sin, a gossip, slander, envy, even those seemingly small ones, anger? Have we experienced the power of the Savior in our lives? How we experience the power of the Savior in our homes? Is there unity? Is there love? Is there peace? That is the Savior. That is Jesus. When he comes into our homes, when he comes into our lives, he saves us from every situation. And that is the power. So this, this Christmas, let us pray that we all experience the power, the saving power of Jesus in our lives. In every area of our lives, every area, then only we can truly say, as Priya said, that Christ is the Lord. When he, when he becomes the Lord of our lives, everything is under him. And that is very important for each one of us. So here is Isaiah. The government will be upon his shoulder. What does it mean? For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. That's what it means. The word government means uh, the seat of power, authority. And, G and Isaiah is prophesying this, right? 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. He's called, that's why he's called the Messianic prophet, right? Why? Because he prophesied about the Messiah more than all other prophets. He's saying that government will be upon his shoulder. Amen. Praise God, isn't it? When so much of uh, political chaos is there, we can be very, very certain that the government will rest on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. <laughs> How wonderful. We don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about the state of anything in our countries. All we have to look at Jesus. And this way it says here in Isaiah 22, verse 21, I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand and hand your authority over to him he will be a father to those who live in jerusalem and to the people of judah you see this so the in, in the king james version the word authority is used as government the government will be upon his shoulder he jesus is going to reign in power and all other enemies 
every enemy will be under his feet. Amen. That is what Jesus is coming to do. The government will rest on his shoulder. And we can be at peace because the government will rest on the shoulder of Jesus Christ. Okay. So one of the names that Isaiah prophesied about Jesus is he will be called the Wonderful Counselor. Okay. And in some versions, brothers and sisters, they even split this. He will be called Wonderful. He will be called Counselor. Okay, so you can put them together and say he'll be a wonderful counselor or he will just be wonderful and he'll be the most amazing counselor. Okay, because that is, that is how, how Jesus is. That is how wonderful he is. And that is such, you know, we, when we look at the life of Jesus, we can see he's so filled with wisdom and that, that you know, that literally like wisdom was flowing out of him. That's why people were amazed when they saw him, when they heard him. And people, you know, one of, one of the gospel texts says, you know, it says they, the people hung on to his words mm -hmm. because there was wisdom, there was power, there was grace, there was authority flowing out of his mouth. And Isaiah prophesies again in Isaiah 28, verse 29. He says, this also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful. That is God. Our God is wonderful. And what does wonderful mean? Extremely good, exceedingly wonderful, exceedingly great. You know, if you just say, okay, what, what does wonderful mean? Oh, it's just amazing. It's, you know, you, we, we have no words to describe it. And when, when we have no words, we say, oh, awesome, wonderful, you know, indescribable. And that's Jesus. That's Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. No, better, no one better than Jesus. And that's what St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 30. Amen. Christ has become for us wisdom. Amen. wisdom. Amen. And he's in us now, brothers and sisters. So all that wonderful counsel, the goodness, the greatness, the wisdom of God has become flesh in us. In us now. Don't think of him as a God who's far away. Oh, wonderful counselor, he's mighty God, everlasting father, and he's in me. He is within me. And all of his wisdom, all of his glory, power, wonder, his excellent wisdom have become flesh in us. We need to keep yielding. We need to keep yielding to his work in us. And we'll be filled with this kind of counsel. And this, what, what they said, uh, you know, in Luke chapter 21, verse 15. Luke, Luke is Luke, quoting a prophecy, says, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. Jesus is talking about his disciples. He says, when they persecute you, when they, when they flog you in the synagogue, I will give you wisdom. And how did Jesus do that? By pouring the spirit into our heart. He says, you don't have to worry about what you have to say. You don't have to think and plan in advance. At that moment, you trust my Holy Spirit and my Holy Spirit will give it to you. We saw this first, first and foremost, it was embodied in Jesus. Jesus did not do any research. Jesus did not, you know, go to Google. Oh, how can I answer the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests when they ask me tricky questions? Wisdom just flowed out of him. How? Because he is wisdom personified and the spirit of God is the source of all wisdom. And now all of this wisdom rests within us. Amen. So we don't need to worry. We don't need to be anxious. When we open our mouth to, to speak to someone, to console them, to counsel them, when we rely on the Holy Spirit, it is this kind of wisdom that will flow out of us. That nobody can resist it. Our enemies cannot resist it. Those who, those who need a word of encouragement will be comforted, will be encouraged, will be lifted up. Because this wonderful counselor lives in us now. He's living in us so that he can minister to all around us. And Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 continues to say, He'll be a mighty God. Wonderful counselor, 
mighty God. The word mighty means showing great power, strength. And we know this. When we read the Gospels, this is what we find. That Jesus is a mighty God. Tremendous power, tremendous authority, tremendous strength demonstrated the power of God. Through, through his preaching, through his teaching, through his miracles, through his healings, through his deliverance. All you can see in the Gospels is a mighty God, right? So the word of God says here. In uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 2. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue. Many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Where did he get it from? Mighty God. Isaiah prophesied that this Messiah... The Savior to be born in the world will be a mighty God. Be a mighty God. And that's why all his followers, even the people who, uh, his detractors, his enemies, couldn't deny the power of God that they could see in Jesus. And they were amazed at his work that he did. And you see, what is the work that Jesus Jesus went about doing good curing the sick, restoring the sight of the blind, making the lame walk, raising the dead back to life, feeding the hungry, driving away, driving away demons possessed from possessed people. And he also preached and enacted the coming of the kingdom of God, isn't it? All we see in the Gospels is this powerful demonstration of the power of God. Isaiah said this many years ago. The Messiah to be born will be a mighty God. And the same God lives in you and me. Amen. Amen. The greater one lives in us. The greater one lives in us. <laughs> that mighty God has not stopped working. That mighty God is continuing to work in our lives. Doing mighty things in our lives. He's going to use us to do mighty things for the kingdom of God. This is the mighty God. This is the power of the mighty God. That we experience his hand. We experience the power and the strength of the mighty God of Jesus. And that is why, brothers and sisters, as we approach to Christmas, let us approach with hope. And that's why Paul said, hope does not disappoint us because of this. It doesn't disappoint. What all that was promised is being fulfilled. It's been fulfilled. And that is very important. Our God is a mighty God and he continues to be a mighty God. He is everlasting father. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was very, very clear, especially in the Gospel of St. John. We see so many scriptures. Jesus very clearly identifies with himself, himself with the father. Okay? So, the role of God as father is that he is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the source. He, from him, all things were, you know, came into existence. He is the source. He is the creator. He is from the beginning to the very end. And he himself is without end. He is forever. He lasts for perpetuity. God is is everlasting brothers and sisters Amen. we need to think about this and marvel at these truths you know it'll be good for us to meditate on these on these four aspects wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace take some time to meditate on these things okay because they're beautiful descriptions of jesus and 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 the, and the whole trinity the whole trinity is displayed in these names of Jesus. And here, here Isaiah is saying he's the everlasting father. He's the father himself who's coming in into, into our midst in the son. In the son. His love. The love of the father. That's why John says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave. And he gave. Whose idea was it? It was the father's idea to give the son, to send the son to be our savior. To be our redeemer. 
And Jesus, the Messiah, is the only one who can reveal God's fatherly character. Jesus took it upon himself. In fact, the whole uh, four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not so much about Jesus as they are about the Father and about the kingdom of God. Jesus is actually coming to tell us, okay, this is what God is like. The Old Testament, their, their images of God, they were so confused. They could not connect with God. They could not even pronounce his name. But Jesus said, no, this is God. He's Abba. He's Father. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus was crucified is because he called himself the Son of God. And he said, everyone, everyone is the child of God. And that, that is the truth, brothers and sisters. And that was the truth for which Jesus gave up his very life. He gave his life to prove that God is Father. What was, the, what was the prodigal son all about? Not so much about a sinful son. It was about the loving heart of the father. And Jesus came particularly to reveal the father's heart to us. And he is one in nature and in essence with the father. Okay, father and son are one in the spirit. In the spirit, all three of them co-equal. In holiness, in greatness, in divinity, in majesty. But Jesus' mission was to reveal the heart of the Father. Okay? So his, and, and how did he reveal the Father? He didn't just say, okay, the Father's like this, the Father's like that. No, he said, look at me. If, if you look at me, if you see me, you have seen the Father. Because he embodied the Father and the Father's character. The very nature of the Father. So Christ's character is a reflection of the Father, perfect Perfect. in every way. Perfect reflection of the Father in every way. He is fatherly, fatherlike in his treatment of us. And this is how Jesus also behaved, brothers and sisters. Although he's the son, he reveals the Father's heart. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one who's willing to lay down my, my life for the sheep. I'm the one who's willing to care for you. I'm giving my life for you. Because this was the father's desire. And Jesus came to fulfill the father's plan, the father's will for each one of us. And we can see this so beautifully, right? Uh, in the in the story, in the parable of the prodigal uh, son, Jesus is showing us so beautifully, you know, the nature of the father, the character of the father, so beautifully. So that is very, very important for each one of us, yeah. And under his care, his protection and his provision. That is the work of the father. The father keeps caring for us, providing for us, protecting us. And we are safe and we will be satisfied, not just here on earth, but for all eternity. Amen. For all eternity. Amen. Jesus is promising us. When we put our trust in him, he will care for us, protect us, provide for us and he will keep us safe. Amen. He will keep us safe and he says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. And no one can snatch you. No one can snatch your loved ones from the hands of Jesus. Leave them there. Leave them there. Trust Jesus with the soul of your loved one. The anxious, the one you're anxious about, the one you're, you're uh, you know, worried about all the time. What will happen to this child of mine, this wayward son, this prodigal daughter, the one who's so disobedient, the one who's so distracted, the one who's so disinterested, the one who's so worldly? Are you worried about them? Leave them in his hands. The everlasting father will keep them as the apple of his eye. You trust, you pray in tongues. Don't let go. Amen. Don't let go. Amen. The father will not let go. And Jesus says, no one can snatch them from my hand. He will save. He will heal. He will restore. He will redeem. Okay, John chapter 10, verse 30 and 38. It says, I and the Father are one. Jesus is, you know, claiming equality with God, which nobody dared to do. He could claim it because he is. He is equal with God. And then he says, you know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. You know, in so many ways, he explained to them 
they did not understand, they did not believe, they did not accept, they were horrified. And most of all, they just didn't care. They just didn't care that God was reaching out to them in the flesh. And that's why they decided to go, and go ahead and crucify him. But he is, and he always remains as the everlasting father. And just as, you know, and, and the way Jesus describes his relationship with the father, Jesus is inviting us, brothers and sisters, to have that kind of a relationship with, with his father. Just as Jesus and the father are one, you and I must say, I and the father are one. Because that's the kind of relationship we are called to have in Christ Jesus. We are sons of God, daughters of God, heirs of God, joined us with Christ. Whatever Jesus has and is, he has given to us. To us through the Holy Spirit. So all of this that Jesus reveals about himself is for us to become one with the Father. Okay? Yeah. And that's the reason Jesus was so surprised and shocked at the question that Philip asked him. Remember Philip asked him, Lord, show us the Father. That will do. So Jesus was really surprised. See how Jesus responds to Philip. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus is that perfect reflection of the Father. And that's why Isaiah is using that word, he will be an everlasting Father. <laughs> everlasting means he's going to reveal the character of the Father. How wonderful, isn't it? That is why, and then it goes, you know, he says, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Right? And that's why uh, Jesus explains more to Philip. Explains more to Philip. How, you see, the, how the Trinity works. Three persons, one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How it works. It's so hard to understand. Very difficult to explain Trinity, right? Explain Trinity. Even the greatest minds are, are struggling to explain this concept. But God is one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that unity, the same unity, the same communion that the Trinity experiences and have is in us. And that is why unity communion, love, every Christian must experience and show to others. Anything other than that is the work of the evil. It's the work of the evil. The Trinity always brings peace. The Trinity always brings love. The Trinity always brings unity. Always brings unity. There is no disunity. If you want to know God, if you want to know what God is like, we have to look at Jesus. The reflection of the Father. So this is why we, we need to look at more to Jesus, focus more on Jesus. All our attention has to be on Jesus. It's very, very important. Jesus is the perfect image of God and the exact representation of his being. Jesus alone makes the Father known. Indeed, no one can come to the Father except through him. And how important this is for us today. In the context of uh, today's uh, situation that we are in uh, India or other countries too. That we should realize that Jesus alone can make the Father known. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus. That means only through Jesus. And it's so important. That's why Christmas is so important. He came not to just save Catholics. Jesus just not, didn't come as a savior only for Christians. He was given to the entire world. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So brothers and sisters, this time, you know, during this time when you are reaching out maybe to even your non-Christian neighbors, you know, they give you sweets during Diwali and you give back sweets during Christmas time. Don't just give sweets. Give them a New Testament. Try and spend time with them sometime. Maybe not on Christmas Day, of course, 
But during, you know, when, when you know they're, they're struggling, when you know they're in need, go reach out to them. Pray with them. Pray for them. Speak to them about Jesus. Maybe if they're, they're open, along with the sweets, give a New Testament. Amen. Give a New Testament on the same tray. They're not going to take it and throw it off. They will be very happy. They'll be happy to receive it. And most of the New Testaments come with, you know, little uh, scripture passages to pray when you are anxious, when you're worried and this and that. They will also look it up. Even if they don't open the whole Bible to read it, they will read at least the first few pages. The message of salvation is given there, you know, in four points. And it's so beautiful. What a marvelous Christmas it will be if we can give them not just sweets. Amen. But Jesus, because no one can come to the Father except through him. Amen. Don't you want your neighbors to be saved? Reach out. Reach out, brothers and sisters. And he is the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Amen. There is peace nowhere else. Amen. No one else can give peace which is abiding, which will last forever. And the, and the word peace in Hebrew is shalom. Okay? And this word is, you know, so commonly used in Israel and, you know, among the Jews. It was a greeting. They would greet them, greet each other saying shalom, shalom. What a beautiful, what a beautiful word. And I've had this experience, you know, uh, whenever I used to go to Indonesia on mission, they greet each other with the word shalom. Every meeting starts with the word shalom. We use praise the Lord, fair enough. They say shalom because, you know, they use it, peace. And it's such a beautiful greeting. It okay. also means, yeah. And this is the meaning of the word shalom. Shalom is not just peace. Okay, peace is one, one aspect mm. of the word shalom. The full meaning of the word shalom is when you are wishing someone shalom, you're wishing them completeness. You're wishing them wholeness, rest, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, fullness, harmony, lack of worry, the absence of agitation or of discord. Amen. What a wonderful word, brothers Praise and Lord. sisters. Brothers and sisters. This is God's gift to us. That's why this Prince of Peace when he was born as a baby, he didn't really, you know, he couldn't give that peace. When did this peace become a reality? When did he actually manage to give this shalom peace? He gave it after his resurrection. That is why, that is why he greeted his disciples. Peace be with you. He said, peace be with you. Because he had become the one, the one means. Through whom God's peace, shalom peace, could live in us. And this is shalom peace, brothers and sisters. Everything that you could ever ask for or even imagine, that's what has already been given to us in Christ Jesus. And this is the shalom peace that we offer each other at Mass. Amen. When we offer it, the sign of the peace, remember the word shalom and remember what it really means. We are wishing our brother and sister this shalom and this peace. So wonderful, right? Okay, and this shalom peace is a person. Amen. It's Amen. the person of Jesus himself. He is the Prince of Peace. There's no peace without Jesus. I'm sure you've all, all seen the taglines, no? No Jesus, no peace. You know Jesus and you will know peace. Amen. There is no other other name there is no other person there's no other god who can give peace because jesus is the source and the summit of peace and only through him can we experience peace yeah and uh, uh, in, in luke you right chapter 2 verses 9 to 11 uh, glory to god in the highest heaven and on earth peace shalom remember the word shalom among whom he favors. Yeah. And then in, in John 14, 27, the very, very words of Jesus, peace I leave with you. Shalom. Yeah. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. 
this is peace lasting peace peace that passes all understanding when we experience the peace that passes all understanding that is jesus again you know then we will not be troubled we will not become anxious we will not get afraid no yeah shallow means not to get worried not to get agitated not to be anxious that is shallow and that is the peace that jesus came to give the entire world actually entire world entire world is looking for peace today there's no doubt about it and it can only be found in the prince of peace jesus christ ephesians chapter 2 uh 14 it says for he himself is our peace who's that jesus how oh, beautiful isn't it he himself is our peace who has made two one and has thrown down the dividing walls of hostility wherever jesus is there is peace he always brings the two and make one he brings people together he does not divide he does not, uh, he does not, uh, uh, you know, he does not divide or, you know, create uh, confusion. No, the Prince of Peace always brings people together, always brings people together. And that is the sign that the Prince of Peace reigns in your heart, reigns in a situation, reigns in our family. That is the sign. And as the Beatitude tells us, dear brothers and sisters, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus was the first peacemaker. He made peace between us and God. And he continues to make peace between us and anyone who is against us or who we are against. That's why he makes the two one. If there is confusion, if there is discord, if there is disunity between you and your spouse, misunderstanding, unforgiveness, between you, your in-laws, hatred, desire for revenge and maybe maybe between you and your neighbors no love no care no forgiveness today let us truly be and reach out as peacemakers amen as peacemakers this is a season of peace this is a season of peace blessed are the peacemakers they shall be called the sons and daughters of god jesus was the first peacemaker the the only begotten son of god and when we share in his mission we too become and live and we are called to walk as sons and daughters of god as peacemakers and let us all start this with our own families amen right own from charity begins at home own families on christmas day even now as you hear this message after this message is over offer peace to your uh, to, to your uh, spouse to your children give them a hug and experience, tell them shalom. Now, whatever has happened has happened, and now we are one. The shalom is that it makes us one. It's very, very important for each one of us. So, in conclusion, sisters and brothers, you know, uh, we just in a very brief way, you know, we uh, try to uh, just you know unfold, you know, the beautiful Christmas story because it was Jesus is no ordinary person. We know that extraordinary, par extraordinary, right? prophesied many many years ago the birth of jesus is the good news jesus is the good news Amen. good news is not just you know a, a word no jesus is the good news so when we say good news we give jesus he is the savior he is the prince of peace and so my uh, 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 let us uh, before we get into anything else we got a few more minutes we'll get into anything else let's close our eyes let's close our eyes Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you. We bless you. Yeah. Thank you for this yeah. glorious season. As we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior. Thank you, Lord. Long, long ago, you promised a Savior. Born of a virgin. Every prophecy has been fulfilled. Amen. Because you Amen. are the only way, the truth and the life. Nobody else. No one else can ever fit that road. Thank you, Lord. The government is on your shoulder. You're a wonderful counselor. Mighty God. The everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. 
every aspect of this lord we want to experience our lives Amen. in our families yes, in our children yes, and every aspect of this we want to give to the world only we can give this lord only we can share this true shalom the prince of peace with others all other kinds of peace are all temporary your peace lord is permanent and everlasting Amen. in jesus mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.